Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Mati Friedman is an award-winning journalist and author. Born in Toronto and based in Jerusalem, he's a frequent contributor to the New York Times opinion page. Friedman's last book, Spies of No Country, Secret Lives at the Birth of Israel, won the 2019 Natan Prize and the Canadian Jewish Book Award for History. His bestseller, Pumpkin Flowers, A Soldier's Story of a Forgotten War, was chosen in 2016 as a New York Times notable book and one of Amazon's 10 best books of the year. His latest is Who By Fire? Leonard Cohen in the Sinai. It's a book about the little known trip that the famous singer took to Israel in the middle of the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Welcome, Mati Friedman. And hello, Mati. Hi, Abby. I wish we could be together, but this is the next best thing across the ocean. You're in a different time zone. I've had breakfast, you've probably had wine for dinner. <laughs> um, but let's get to this wonderful, luminous book, uh, Who By Fire? Why this book, why now? Has Leonard Cohen been in your life all this time? Well, first of all, I didn't have wine uh, for dinner because I thought that would make our interview too interesting. I respect so, that. I respect your sobriety I, for me. I, I stuck to water this time. The, um, the story has always been something I wanted to unpack ever since I heard it for the first time, which was in 2009 when Cohen showed up here for a concert and Israelis went nuts for Cohen, and I couldn't qu quite figure out why until I saw a story in one of the Israeli papers about this tour, this bizarre concert tour in which at one of the darkest moments in Israel's history, it's the beginning of the Yom Kippur War, um, the army's in disarray, the army's almost losing the war. Uh, Israel's been surprised on two fronts. Give us the year. And 1973, October 1973, Yom Kippur, October 6th. Um, really one of one of the blackest moments in Israel's history and a trauma that persists in many ways to this day. So um, the army is in, in disarray and out of the smoke of battle in Sinai comes Leonard Cohen <laughs> on some kind of bizarre like what is he doing Jewish here? quest. And he gave a concert tour, which was unforgettable for the people who saw it and completely unmentioned anywhere else, including by Leonard Cohen himself. And that struck me as really interesting and worth worth unpacking. It took me a while to uh, to unpack it. That concert was in 2009 and the book just came out. Um, but that's um, that's what Who By Fire and is. And before we flash back to 1973, let's stick with 2009 at this concert. Give us a sense of where Leonard Cohen is at that point, because he's hugely famous um, at that point. But but there have been a lot of twists and turns. Cause can you kind of give us the snapshot? So Leonard Cohen begins as a Canadian poet. He's from Montreal. I'm also Canadian, so part of my connection to this story we is, hear it, by the way. is that, it. of course, <laughs> you know, there's not that many great Canadian Israeli stories that really suit my uh, precise talents as a Canadian Israeli journalist. Um, Cohen comes up as a Canadian poet and then graduates, I guess one would say, into the American folk scene of the 60s. And he's in the village and he's with Joan Baez and Judy Collins and all the great names of Bob Dylan and all the great names of the village at that time. And then and becomes a, a massive star. And, and probably you know, people watching us are familiar with his greatest hits, Suzanne and So Long, Marianne. Likely star, time. right? He doesn't look like one. He doesn't sound like one. That's right. That's right. He's a really unique character. He's older than the other stars of that time. He's already in his 30s, and people tend to be very informally dressed because it's the 60s, so it's all jeans and shaggy hair. And Leonard Cohen generally wears a suit, and he never changes his very Jewish name, which makes him unique in a world where there was a lot of pressure to get rid of those very unsexy Jewish names. 
and assume new names like Bob Dylan and Cohen doesn't. And he has his own very unique approach to poetry and to, and to, to music, which is formed in, in Montreal in a very different place than the, the, the folk scene where he ends up. So he re really retains something, there's something very original in his voice, but he becomes a major star. And then leaning on your windowsill, he'll say one day you caused his will to weaken with your love and warmth and shelter. And then taking from his wallet an old schedule of trains, he'll say I told you when I came I was a stranger I told you when I came I was a stranger And um, by 1973 is a major star who's kind of on the rocks. He's hit a wall in his career and he's told interviewers that he's retiring, that he just wants to, to shut up. Uh, he's having a personal crisis. He's living on a Greek island called Hydra with a woman named Suzanne, who's not the Suzanne of the song Suzanne. She was a dancer in Montreal. This is a different Suzanne who is the mother of Cohen's first child at that time, Adam, who's one year old. So the 1973 war and that concert tour, they catch Cohen at a very bleak moment in, in his life. And it actually ends up being kind of a turning point for Cohen. And it sets his career back on track in a very interesting way. And the idea that when he's this down, this despondent and ready to kind of throw it in, not sing anymore, not perform anymore, he decides to go to this war. What do you think propels him to get on a plane? It's not like the IDF is expecting him or asking for him. They need Leonard Cohen to command one of the tank divisions in Sinai. They've heard he's a strategic genius. And Cohen does have a song called Field Commander Cohen, but um, it's tongue in cheek. I don't think the army really thought that he had a lot to contribute in terms of, you know, general staff planning. No, Cohen is driven by two or he's driven by something and pulled by something. He's, he's driven by his personal crisis, that fall. And this feeling that he just has to get out. He has to escape his life somehow. And we know this thanks to an incredible manuscript that he wrote about the experience, which I was lucky enough to find a 45 page, very weird, very rough and obscene um, manuscript that he writes immediately after these events and never publishes. So I kind of lucked into this manuscript in a box. Where was it? It was at a university library in Hamilton, Ontario at the McMaster University Library and a very intrepid librarian managed to pull it out of the stacks for me and he scanned it and he sent it to me. Chris Long, I like to mention his name because he's he played a key role in the in the writing of this book. So that's how we know what Cohen's mental state was. And that was never understood in the story of this tour, although almost no one even knew about the story of this tour, but the few people who cared about it never understood exactly where it caught Cohen in his life. And in the um, in the manuscript, it's very clear that this is a really bad time for Leonard Cohen. Many of us remember the late Leonard Cohen, who is a very elegant elderly gentleman with a fedora, kind of smiling out at stadiums of adoring fans. And he seems very reconciled and, and gracious and grateful and happy. That's not Leonard Cohen in 1973. You, you write Co uh, Cohen, who showed up in Sinai, at least as far as his writings reveal, was a dark and flawed character, both angry and depressed. He was di driven by lust, treated women awfully, and was totally self-involved. <laughs> yes, that's, that's true. <laughs> um, so he's complex. Which, I mean, he's beloved, but he's, he's not exactly, you know, your, your picture-perfect celebrity. There's a lot of darkness. That's right. He's, he's a much harder guy to love than the late Leonard Cohen, which was surprising to me when I first encountered this version of Leonard Cohen. Ultimately, it makes for a more interesting story and a more interesting book. Uh, but in terms of the person who I, I would have met had I been in Sinai in 1973, I'm not quite sure I would have liked him. And um, he's a prickly character. He's a rock star. Um, and, you know, he's... Uh, He's very involved with himself and less, less so with <laughs> the people around him. And what makes Leonard Cohen great is that he's aware of it. Like he knows who he is. He's not, he doesn't buy into his own mythology. And we also know that ultimately he'll become something else. Because we, we know the late Cohen and we, we know that his trajectory is heading in quite an amazing direction. So we, we forgive Leonard Cohen. So that's part of what was going on, that personal crisis mm. that drives him. And what pulls him is this 
this war, this sense that the Jewish people is in crisis. And Khan was a deeply Jewish character. He wasn't religiously observant by the time we meet him in 1973, but he grew up in a very tight and very serious Jewish community in Montreal, immersed in Jewish text. His grandfather was a rabbi who was an expert on Hebrew, Hebrew grammar uh, from Lithuania. And his other grandfather had been the president of the most important Jewish congregation in Montreal, which is called still Shara Shomayim. So he comes from a very serious family and he never claims to be anything else. He never leaves Judaism. He goes very far from his synagogue, uh, of course, but he he always retains a sense of himself as a Jew. And he says afterwards, that when the Jewish people is in crisis, I'll be there. He's not going to stand. I'd and he by. showed up um, as Eliezer, am I right, as, with his Hebrew name? One of the interesting details in this story is that he asked the Israeli musicians who end up traveling with him in, in the war, he asks them to call him Eliezer, which is his Hebrew name. And Israelis have a really hard time with Leonard. That name is just hard to say in Hebrew. So to this day, he's called Leonard, <laughs> which is, sounds like a foreigner. But Eliezer sounds like a local. Like Eliezer is Eliezer Cohen is like Joe Smith for Israelis. It's everybody in the country is Eliezer Cohen. So he kind of goes native initially upon landing in Israel. And you see him in photographs wearing clothes that look like fatigues. And he um, he identifies very deeply with, with the Israeli soldiers and asks to be called by a Hebrew name. That changes as the war progresses. And that's very much part of the story of Leonard Cohen in Sinai. But initially, it's a response to a Jewish crisis and a sense that he has to come and help somehow. And let's talk about that Jewish crisis before we get to his arrival. Because for, for those who don't remember 1973 and how unique those events were and how formative, um, not just for... Uh, for Israel, but for Jewish Americans to watch what happened. We had the high of the uh, unlikely triumph of 67, and now 73 is the antithesis. Can you just set the stage of why this, this was such a, a seminal uh, war? So you set it up exactly right. 1967 is this incredible victory against very steep odds. Israel manages to fend off three Arab armies and, and expand the territory under its control. And Israel enters a period of euphoria. That's how Israelis remember it as the euphoria after 67. And Israelis are in love with the army. And it's the kind of heyday of the Zionist leadership that founded the country. And then and, and people don't expect another war. Because you know we we won so conclusively in '67, how could how could there be another war? And then at 2 p.m. on Yom Kippur, 1973, so October 6, 1973, the country is shut down for Yom Kippur. As as you know, the country goes completely quiet on that day. There's no radio broadcast. There's no TV. There's no cars on the on, on the roads. People are fasting generally and in synagogue for Yom Kippur, even people who aren't religious, the observant most of the year. And at 2 p.m., so in the middle of this incredibly solemn day, the Day of Atonement, there are surprise attacks, one in the north and one in the south. The Syrians push into the Golan Heights and the Egyptian army crosses the Suez Canal and the army is caught completely off guard and overrun initially in the first few days of the war. And the shock of that and the knowledge, the shocking knowledge that the army might not win the war, that Israel came close to losing the war, that shock really hasn't worn off. In Israel, people are still kind of um, today, in the shadow of what today. happened today in 2022, are still in the shadow of what happened in 73. Every year before Yom Kippur, there are more articles in the newspaper, more books are published about the war. Anyone who was here that day will, will never forget it. And because the casualties were so high, 2,600 fatalities in a country that was barely 3 million people at the time, I mean, basically the whole country was affected by by the war and it was an incredibly traumatic moment and Leonard Cohen kind of blunders into it and ends up being part of it in a very interesting way that of course he didn't plan. So let's talk about the cafe, which it seems to be where it kind of begins. He doesn't even show up in Israel with his guitar. He's really not there as a musician ready to go to work and he's recognized in the cafe. Tell us that story. When I started researching the story, I assumed that he came to sing for troops because I knew that that's what happened um, eventually, but it, it, it's quite clear that he had no intention of, of, of performing at the front. He tells people when he arrives that he wants to volunteer on a kibbutz, that he wants to pick grapefruit, according to one version. And um, so he has no guitar and he's already announced his retirement from the music business, which happened not long before the war. So he's not coming as Leonard Cohen, the rock star. And of course, he comes without an entourage. He comes by himself without a plan. And he bums around the country for a few days and we have some great descriptions from him 
of the people who he meets in, in Israel at that time, these very strange days in the middle of the Yom Kippur War. And then he's in a cafe in Tel Aviv, which is one of the two bohemian cafes in the country at the time. I mean, the country's bohemian scene barely exists. Israel's 25 years old at the time, and it's still very much it's a, baby. a traumatized country. The yeah. Holocaust was was a recent memory for people, and um, the country was very fragile. It's all very kind of new and, and primal. And um, he's in one of these cafes, and he's recognized by a few Israeli musicians who happened to be in the same cafe. And these musicians were famous Israeli musicians, but Leonard Cohen had no idea who they were. And they're sitting at, according to their account, they're sitting at a table and they see a guy in the corner and they think it might be Leonard Cohen, who's a major international star. It makes very little sense that he'd be just hanging out in a cafe in the middle of the war. And one of them goes over and asks him, are you Leonard Cohen? And Leonard Cohen says, yes. And, and then um, he tells, he explains that he's come to volunteer on a kibbutz to volunteer in the harvest. And they're like, no, no, there's no harvest right now. Um, you have to come with us. We're going to play for troops in Israel when a war breaks out all of the performers take their instruments and they go to perform for the soldiers. That's kind of part of the unwritten agreement between performers and, and the country. And they were about to head off to sing for soldiers. And they managed to convince Cohen, they find a guitar and they pile into a, a Ford Falcon, which is owned by Oshik Levy, who's a famous Israeli musician at that time. And that's how Cohen gets sucked into the story of the Yom Kippur War and into one of the strangest and I think greatest moments in rock and roll history. Mm. And you said that uh, in the manuscript that you discovered, he wrote that he would often be driven around in the middle of the night until the Jeep happened upon tired soldiers. I mean, they didn't even have necessarily a road map, an itinerary. It's like they went where the need was or where soldiers were. There was no organization involved in the tour. So if people are imagining a kind of organized USO type tour or a Bob Hope type tour, but there was nothing like that. It was completely chaotic. Israel is chaotic at the best of times, but in a war it's, you know, it's even more so of course, and no one was, uh, was in charge. I mean, there's no record of this tour in the army archives in part because there was no organization involved. The musicians were basically roaming around the front. And when I spoke to Oshik Levy, the singer who was with Cohen, he said that the way it would work was that in Sinai, they'd be at some central location or some base. And then these very young cultural officers would come and they would fight with each other about which unit had more fatalities, mm -hmm. like who was in worse shape. And if you were in the worst shape, you would get the best artists. And that's how it would be settled. So they would just take you and they'd say, you know, you know, Mr. Cohen, please come with me. And they would go off in a Jeep and they would play for a dozen soldiers, for two dozen soldiers. We have accounts of Cohen playing for three or four soldiers. You oh, even have a one story where uh, they went to the Golan Heights after a bloody skirmish. And you write, they drove up to a base that had just been lost to the Syrians, then recaptured. Almost no one was alive. The guard at the gate told us, this is Cohen's words, go straight uphill and see if there's anyone left to play for. Incredible. Right. So that's, that's actually another cell of musicians that was touring the, the, the Golan front. But those experiences oh. were very typical of, um, of the Sinai front as well. I mean, th this was the middle of the action. Mm -hmm. They weren't being kept a safe different, a distance from the front, which you would expect, you know, an international a performer like Leonard Cohen, the army, you would think, would be taking care of him and making sure that he wasn't getting too close to the action. But no one was. And, and Cohen actually manages to cross the Suez Canal a day or two behind the Israeli army when the great counterattack comes that changes the course of the Yom Kippur War. And the Israelis manage to cross the canal. We have um, photographs of Cohen on the other side of the canal very soon after that moment. And we have these accounts of him driving in a jeep in the middle of the desert, stopping when when the musicians see a few artillery pieces parked in the sand and they would get out of the Jeep, see if the guys wanted to hear some music. And these guys were really banged up and they were exhausted and half deaf and they'd seen terrible things. And, and if they were interested in, in hearing music and not all of them were, then they would set up a stage. The musicians would set up a stage made out of ammunition crates and they would play on the crates. And, and, and you Cohen said that would, often it was going to be the last, the last music that they possibly ever heard. 18-year-olds, so 19-year-olds. That's right. Everyone present at these concerts understands, including Cohen, understands that this might be the last thing that these guys hear. It's a matter of, of life and death, these concerts, and that's what makes it so powerful. That's why this experience is so powerful. And, and that, I think, also helps 
restore Cohen's faith in, faith in his art because there's no money changing hands. This is not about the music business. That no one's selling records. Everyone's sober. Um, it's it's just a pure artistic transmission. And what do you, that has what, the weight how, of of life and death? How do you account for just why? anyone wants to hear it. I mean, I can't imagine when the stakes are so high and the risks are so great that you want to sit down and hear a song or that you even have the sort of the bandwidth, the emotional bandwidth for that. But it, it feels, I mean, is that particularly Israeli or is that kind of a lazy assumption? No, it's, it's a good question. I think not everyone did want to hear music. And um, we have accounts from other musicians, you know, they'd show up at a base and no one would be interested in hearing them. It depended on who the soldiers were and how, you know, <laughs> how traumatized they were that, that day. But, but many people did. Many people wanted to escape the war for a few moments. Many people were really excited to see Leonard Cohen, those who knew Leonard Cohen, not everyone knew who he was, mm -hmm. but the people who did know who he was, you know, thought it was amazing and, and bizarre. And the pictures that, that you've shared there in your book, and we'll share them here, of the faces listening to him, the upturned faces, the seriousness and the kind of connectivity, it feels like they're in it. It doesn't feel like they're distracted at all. And sometimes there's quite large crowds. Yeah, you look at those photographs and you can see that the, the crowd is very intent and that Cohen seems uplifted. And it's these aren't staged photographs. These are photographs taken by soldiers. So it's not like there's a PR crew there trying to get the best shot possible. This is all very, um, very real. And there's something about Cohen that strikes the soldiers as as authentic. And I think it helps that he's not there with a film crew and no one is documenting these concerts. We have no video of any of these concerts. We and he have doesn't have audio. his trailer. I mean, he's sleeping on the ground. He's eating rations like the soldiers are. Just kind of describe, I mean, he, it's not like there was any special treatment for him, correct? That's right. I mean, there was no there was no special treatment at all. And on occasion, they offered to find him a room to sleep in rather than sleeping on the ground with everyone else. And he said no. He wanted to be there with with the soldiers and with the other performers who were basically living with the soldiers. And, and that's the only way this tour could have worked. If Cohen had been treated like a prima donna and if he'd been there with, you know, some kind of entourage or if the soldiers had sensed that they were being exploited in some way, it would never it would never have worked. It worked because Cohen struck them as completely authentic because he was there by himself on some kind of personal mission and that he, he'd come to help, which he did. I mean, how he thought he could help is an interesting question. What can a performer do in a war? But that is what he believed and the soldiers sensed it. And that's what made these concerts unforgettable for people who were lucky enough to be And there. you quote him saying, there were suggestions here and there that I was useful. Talk right, about that Cohen, word useful. Right, that's Cohen being, mo like being modest, but it's it's the closest thing to a, to a to a brag that you'll get in this manuscript, which is very modest and very self-critical. And so when he says there's, there are hints here and there that I was useful, he's proud of himself. He's managed to do something that's, that's worthwhile. And, I, and, and this is a guy who's lost faith that his songs have any meaning. He doesn't want to sing anymore, in part because he's so disgusted with the music business and he thinks it doesn't mean anything. And suddenly he's in a place where music is a matter of life and death and people are saying, thank you for coming. It's so great that you came. Thank you for singing for us. And, and he says, I feel... I feel useful. And if we're looking for kind of the resurrection of Cohen in this war, because that, that happens, right? Cohen doesn't retire. Cohen doesn't leave the music business. Mm -hmm. In fact, Cohen ends up putting out one of the best albums of his career and getting back on the, on the horse and going on to release some of the greatest music of all time, including songs like Hallelujah. So this happens in the war. And if we're wondering how, I think, I think that's it. It's the sense that his music mattered and he felt that for the first time in, and in the jewish time. connection i mean it's it seems like in a way he's he's dodging and weaving a little bit on just how jewish he feels and how much he's holding on to everything he got from his childhood from his father grand uh, his inheritance when it comes to observance um, but i love your quote uh, from him he says my own tradition which is the hebraic tradition suggests that you sit next to the disaster and lament the notion of lamentation seemed to me to be the way to do it you don't avoid the situation, you throw yourself into it. Mm. Is that kind of operating here? A sense of showing up, a sense of almost being at the sick bed, the proverbial sick bed. Yes, yeah, I love that quote too. And no one says it better, better than Leonard Cohen. Unfortunately for me, as someone who you know has to write about Leonard Cohen, um, I'm not sure that my prose always competes. He's got these great, you know, very succinct observations and one-liners like the one where he says, um, people say that I'm a pessimist. But that's not true. A pessimist is someone who is afraid that it's going to rain. But me, I'm already wet. Mm. So that sentiment works in a war. That idea that we're in the catastrophe, it's already happened. 
let's not delude ourselves with happy songs. I'm not here to make you laugh. I'm not here to play frivolous music that will get your mind off what's going on. I'm actually going to address, you know, the deepest corners of your soul. And even though many of the soldiers presumably couldn't understand what Cohen was talking about because they didn't know English, there's something about Cohen's presentation that really transfixes an audience, even if you don't necessarily understand the words. And that's one reason that it, that it worked, that idea that he's here to lament the catastrophe. He's, he knows what's going on and he knows the human condition is really, really rough. And that's not just in the war, that's you know, the human condition writ large and something about that sentiment seems to have really worked here. Let's talk about his ambivalence that comes, comes through again subtly in, in your wonderful book about his Zionism or certainly Israel's nationalism. Is that also playing out because it feels like he's with the team when he's in the desert, but then maybe he goes home and thinks a little bit, thinks twice uh, about what that means. Right, which is so Jewish, right? Am I on the team? Do we have a team? <laughs> Whose team am I on? Is it on? okay to, to, to be a team? Is that okay? Right, exactly. I mean, is it right? Exactly. And if I'm not, not if I'm on my team, am I not on the other guy's team? And maybe I should be on the other guy's team. Um, so that's very Jewish. And you can definitely see it in the story of this war. And Cohen comes in, as we've said, very um, intent on, on helping. And he refers to the soldiers in one verse, which he later erases as his brothers. And he calls himself Eliezer Cohen. And uh, he's very much on the Israeli side. Of course, he's come to help the Jewish people in a great crisis. And then as the war progresses, I think he he steps back. And we have a moment in this really amazing manuscript that I quote from in the book. We have a moment where I think it it, it is the moment where Cohen kind of breaks and his approach to the war begins to change, which is that He's at an airbase in deep in the battle zone and a, and a helicopter lands with wounded soldiers on it. And Cohen sees these guys. And in fact, we know that the musicians in many cases helped carry wounded soldiers from helicopters to the field hospital. Cohen sees these soldiers who are in really bad shape and he's upset. And in the manuscript, he writes, this is awful. These are young Jews who are dying. And someone who was with him must have seen that he was upset and came up to him and said, um, Leonard or, or Eliezer, don't worry, these are Egyptians. And he's relieved. And then he catches himself and he writes in the manuscript, I hate this relief. This is blood on your hands. Mm. The fact that he was momentarily relieved that these were guys from the other side and not his own guys, you know, that undermines everything Leonard Cohen is as a universal poet. And as a human in his, in, you know, in his mind. And he says and blood on your hands, whose hands do you think? He's his own talking, hands. His own. He's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. Um, he has shed blood the moment that he says, you know, that he's relieved that these are not Israelis. And um, that is the moment, in my opinion, where you really see his approach change. And then he, he starts stepping back a bit from the war and he, he leaves the war, not waving the Israeli flag and singing the national anthem. He leaves quite upset. He writes a song in the war called Lover, 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 which includes a verse that calls the Israeli soldiers his brothers. That verse is erased, never to be heard from again until I publish this book when it resurfaces. And in 1976, just a couple of years after the war, he actually introduces the song by saying that it was written for the Egyptians and for the Israelis in that order. So he kind of goes very deep into his tribal allegiances and then steps back out into a more universalist position, which I think he realizes is necessary for Leonard Cohen, the poet, whatever Leonard Cohen, you know, the Jew from Montreal was thinking, Leonard Cohen, the poet, had to be bigger than one side in this war and bigger than the war. And one of the veterans who you found, you tracked down and interviewed, talked about how moving that lover, lover, lover verse was when he called them his brothers, referred to them as brothers. And then he writes, or told you, about a year after the war, I was driving along when I heard the chorus, lover, 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 and I turned up the volume and heard the legendary song. I was overwhelmed. I pulled over and listened, waiting for that line, waiting for brothers, and the song ended without it. The lines had disappeared. That soldier is quite an amazing character. And um, I guess I should say that the book, as much as it's about Cohen, it's about the soldiers who saw Cohen. And it's, it uses Cohen to see the war in a new light as much as it uses the war to see Cohen in a new light. And that soldier Shlomi was, he's now a grandfather, but at the time he was a young officer in a pickup unit of commandos, kind of an, um, an ad hoc um, unit of guys who were involved in some of the thickest of the fighting around the Suez Canal and on, on the other side of the canal one night, he meets Leonard Cohen playing uh, 
next to a, an encampment where they were sleeping and, and he hears Cohen play this song, Lover, 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 which no one knows because it had just been written. It was written in the war. And he hears this verse in which Leonard Cohen called the Israeli soldiers, his brothers. He, he sang in the verse, I went down to the desert to help my brothers fight. I mean, there's not, there couldn't be a clearer statement of his allegiance That's at pretty, the time. That's pretty explicit. And of course, soldiers remembered that line more than the others because that, you know, made a big impression. And then um, after, the, after the war, that verse is gone. And Shlomi basically never forgives Leonard Cohen <laughs> for, for erasing that verse of the song. And I mean, I can kind of appreciate what Leonard Cohen was doing. And I think it's, it's a very, as we said, it's a very Jewish dilemma to have. You know, who, who am I? What is my role here? What am I doing here? Where do I stand? Just and so did, really wrestled where did you it. find that verse? Where did you actually dig up the so original lyrics? My, right. So my initial assumption was that Shlomi was misremembering because in a war, memories get very weird. And he said, I'll never forget this verse where he called us his brothers. But I knew there was no such verse in Lover, Lover, Lover. And I assumed that he misheard or maybe it was some other song or who knows. And then I got access. One of my um, coups in writing this book was getting access to the Cohen notebooks that are kept by his estate in Los Angeles. Leonard Cohen always had a little notebook in his pocket, and that's where he would write down thoughts, you know, rough drafts of poems, people's phone numbers. Um, and, there, and these notebooks were preserved and are kept by, by the Cohen estate, which was generous enough to, to allow me access. And I was flipping through one of the notebooks that he kept at the time of the war. And I found the first draft of Lover, 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 which is really exciting if you're a Cohen fan to see something being born in Cohen's handwriting. And then immediately after that song, there's another verse. And that's the verse. It's wow. the verse with brothers. And it took me a while to put two and two together, but I realized that that was the verse that had been performed in Israel. That was the verse that made the biggest impression on the Israelis. And that was the verse that Banished immediately after the war. Let's take a listen to that song for a minute. Cette chanson, j'ai écrit pour les Égyptiens et les Israélites pendant la guerre de Sinai. So Ariel Sharon, who ultimately becomes prime minister, is in this photo standing next to Leonard Cohen. Kind of amazing to see the young general there. Um, and he writes about him. Tell us a little bit about Leonard Cohen's response to Ariel Sharon. Right. So these are two Jewish archetypes, maybe the two Jewish archetypes of the 20th century. You have the, the artist, you know, who's a diaspora figure, one of the great diaspora figures of, of the last hundred years, in my opinion, and the man of poetry and kind of um, of art and man of peace, maybe. And you have this general who kind of embodies what the Jewish people has to do to survive in our times, which is to employ violence. And Leonard Cohen seems to have made no impression at all on Ariel Sharon, who doesn't even mention him in any of his um, own writing about the war. I called up Sharon's son to ask him if maybe he'd heard anything from Sharon about meeting Leonard Cohen in the desert. No, Cohen, yeah, Sharon seems not to have noticed that he met Leonard Cohen. But Leonard Cohen definitely remembered meeting Sharon. And Sharon is one of the few characters who he mentions by name in this manuscript. And he, um, he refers to him as the um, the Lion of the Desert, uh, which is a play on, Char on the Sharon's name, Ariel, Ari is, is Lion. So he's um, very, very taken with him. He's kind of disgusted by him and taken with him. He says, I look, and I looked at this general and I said, how dare you? Which I, I think he meant like, how dare you make decisions of life and death and employ mm -hmm. violence? And, you know, how dare you do that? And at the same time, Leonard Cohen says, I want your job because there's part of Leonard Cohen that kind of is drawn to violence and he's not a pacifist, Leonard Cohen. And we have to remember that one of his most enduring songs is his version of The Partisan, which is an ode to armed resistance. 
port across the border. I was cautioned to surrender. This I could not do. I took my gun and vanished. I have changed my name so often. Yes, I've lost my wife and children, but I have many friends. And some of them are with me, with me right here tonight. An old woman gave us shelter, kept us hidden in the garret. Then the soldiers came. Died without a whisper, without a whisper. There were three of us this morning. I am the only one this evening, but I will go on. These frontiers are my prison. The wind, the wind is blowing through these graves. The wind is blowing. Freedom soon will come. Then we'll come from these shadows, all、oh, these shadows. Cohen always kept his father's. Gun, and he wasn't kind of he wasn't a pacifist on, in the '60s model, and there was part of him that was drawn to to the military. His father had been an officer in the Great War, and、um, he's drawn to the military and drawn to violence. As at the same time, of course, he abhorred violence. So there's something about Sharon that he finds fascinating, and that picture where they both appear is, in my opinion, one of the great one of the great Jewish photographs of you know the last century for sure. So I, I saw there was a Cohen interview about this very brief, where he was asked about whether he felt any personal anxiety about being killed, and he said, "I did once or twice, but you get caught up in the thing, and the desert is beautiful, and you think your life is meaningful for a moment or two, and war is wonderful. They'll never stamp it out. It's one of the few times people can act their best." What did he mean? I think he was getting at something real, and you know, in, in war, which is that it's. It's the most awful aspect of human existence, and people behave terribly and do terrible things to each other. And it's really hard to picture anything that could be worse than a war. And you know, many of us are watching what's happening now in Ukraine, and it's hard to imagine, you know, <laughs> a worse set of circumstances than that. At the same time, in a war, and this is what Cohen's getting at, you see some of the most beautiful things that you can ever see in humanity: people behaving in a way that's completely selfless, people motivated by things other than personal interests and money. He says every gesture has significance. Nothing is unnecessary. No one's goofing off. He says, and he, and people are kind of working together for a common purpose, which is is something that humans are not prone to do very often. And and he gets that, and he put it beautifully in that interview, which, by the way, is one of the last times he ever mentioned the Yom Kippur War. That's almost、um, that, that's very soon after the war. And then, you know, pretty soon after that, he stops mentioning the war. But that take on the war is so interesting, and, and in my opinion, really, really true. Not that I experienced anything like the Yom Kippur War, but I have been in the military, and there's a lot of beauty in it that gets obscured、um, by the ugliness in it. But of course, both coexist. And you say, or have said, that the crisis in the Yom Kippur War was, in some ways, a way out of his own crisis.、Mm. Do you think that it actually solved? Not solved completely, but did kind of clarify things. I think it did at least at least for a short period of time.、Uh, he comes back from the war and tells his biographer years later. Sylvie Simmons wrote a great Cohen biography called "I'm Your Man." She asks him about this, and Cohen has really never explained what the war meant to him. And 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 he tells her, luckily for me, by the way, she didn't publish this quote, and she let me publish it. But he said that I came back from the war and I'd seen something really awful about the world, and I, I decided that I was going to tend my own garden, by which he meant he was going to try to have a family life, which his family life had been really falling apart、mm. before the war, and、um, he goes back and he tries to make it work with with his partner Suzanne and with his son Adam, and 
he has another child with Suzanne immediately after the war. It's not exactly nine months, but it's something pretty close. And that's his daughter, Lorca, who's named for the Spanish poet Lorca. And this seems in his account to have been connected to the war, connected to the fact that he'd seen something really dark and wanted to make a little garden for himself. Um, it doesn't last that long because Cohen seems not cut out for it. And, um, and you know, that, that um, relationship falls apart and, he continues um, to move from place to place and from woman to woman, but the war does seem to have clarified things for him, at least for a short period of time. And it definitely clarifies his artistic thinking. It allows him in some very strange way to put together songs and, and release an album, which as I mentioned, is one of his greatest. It's called New Skin for the Old Ceremony, which is a reference to circumcision. And it includes um, Chelsea Hotel, one of Cohen's greatest songs. It includes Lover, 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 which he'd just written in the war. And it includes Who by Fire, which is one of Cohen's most lasting songs. And of course, it's the song whose title I ripped off. Yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about ripping off that amazing title. But it's, it also happens to be the Unatana Tokef prayer. That's and right. I'm, I'm ripping it off from Cohen, but Cohen ripped it off from someone else. So right, that's okay. from someone else. But, but tell us why it's your choice. And for those who have not listened to that incredible song. At my, my synagogue, Central Synagogue, has often actually incorporated, incorporated the Leonard Cohn uh, version with, you know, essentially the liturgy in, in an extraordinary way. Um, it, really, it really is extraordinary because that poem, that prayer is written about a thousand years ago. No one knows exactly by whom or exactly when, but it's about a thousand years old and it's written at this time of incredible violence directed at the Jews of Europe. And that's why it's such a violent prayer. I mean, it's a prayer that says it's Yom Kippur. God is sitting on his throne. He's judging everyone and he's deciding our fate. And he's deciding in the coming year who's going to die and who will live, who by water and who by fire. That's where the line comes from. And then it goes on, who by wild beast, who by sword, who, who by, by stone. strangulation, who by earthquake. And it, it really gets very, very graphic. And you can tell that it's coming out of a, 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 out of a violent time, which provided a lot of memorable imagery for the person who wrote that that prayer. And then the prayer moves through Jewish history and it gets sung a thousand years later at a synagogue in Montreal. And a kid who's sitting in one of the pews at the synagogue hears this song and it goes into his head somewhere. And then he goes out into the world and into the 60s and um, ends up on a Greek island and then ends up in this war. And then in the most amazing way, and he writes a riff on, on the prayer, which, which he calls Who by Fire, which is his own version of that prayer. And then the tune that he writes ends up back in the synagogue mm. being sung together with the same prayer that had inspired him. So it's quite an amazing thing when you think about it. And quite essentially Jewish, as you said, in terms of, you know, the door of a door, but in a, a much more unpredictable way. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think Cohen could have ever imagined that this song, which is kind of tongue in cheek in some ways, um, and certainly irreverent, that that would become a kind of liturgy itself. And that, I, mean, I don't think he could have imagined that. And yet that's what happened. And that, that song, I think, can't be understood without understanding this story, the story of Who by Fire, the story of the Yom Kippur War, because the, the war breaks out not long after that prayer is recited in synagogue. So you have this situation where Jews across the world are saying this prayer. They're saying, God is going to decide our fate. He's deciding it right now. It's the Day of Atonement. It's being decided. Who, who's going to die and who's going to live? Who by water and who by fire? And, and then a war breaks out. The siren goes off at 2 p.m. on Yom Kippur, and thousands of Israelis are sent off to die mm -hmm. in, in the ways described in the, in the prayer. And then Leonard Cohen walks into this war, which is, in the Israeli mind, completely wrapped up with the memory of, of Yom Kippur. So the war and the Jewish holy day, uh, they're all mixed up with each other. Sometimes the Yom Kippur War is called the War of Atonement, as if the war itself were an atonement. Wow. So in Israel today, the memorial for the war is on Yom Kippur. We remember Yom Kippur, the war on Yom Kippur, the holy day. That's when all the newspapers publish stories about the war, and it's all it's all wrapped up together. And Leonard Cohen somehow became mixed up in it. And immediately after the war, he writes this song called Who by Fire, never explicitly links that song to the Yom Kippur War, but it appears in his notebook immediately after the war. And it's all, it's all part of this amazing moment in Jewish history and in music history, which, uh, which is a story that I was lucky enough to stumble on. And who by fire, who by water, who in the sunshine, who in the nighttime, who by high ordeal, who by common trial, 
Who in your merry, merry month of May Who by very slow decay And who, who shall I say Is calling me Who in these realms of love Who by something blonde Who by avalanche Who by powder Who for his greed Who for his hunger And who, who shall I say You say the music changed. When you talk about music history, the music changed after the Yom Kippur War in Israel. Tell us what you mean by that. So the, the Israeli soundtrack leading up to Yom Kippur 73 is still the soundtrack of the founding of the country, which means very kind of upbeat, exuberant kibbutz style music. Yeah, heavy on the accordion, a very on message, Zionism, agriculture. A lot of the hit songs are performed by soldiers, by military entertainment troops that provided a lot of the kind of um, soundtrack of, of Israel up to that point. And it's very much written in the collective we, mm. that music. Israel is in a very collective a collective mood up until 73. And then the war really shatters that. And it shatters the country's confidence in the founding generation. People are very angry that the, the leadership did not see this war coming, that they'd left the army exposed you know, to these, to these surprise attacks. And Golda Meir was out after this. And, That's and right. Golda Meir is remembered as a kind of heroic character outside of Israel. But for Israelis, she's an ambiguous character because of her role in the war. And she, I mean, it takes a few years before the labor government is really voted out of office. 1977 is when it happens, but it's it's a direct result of, of the war. And Israel becomes a very different place. It's much less about the kibbutz and new voices suddenly appear in Israeli society, like Peace Now, which is demanding that the government make peace with, with, um, with Israel's Arab neighbors immediately. The settler movement emerges after the Yom Kippur War. Jews who came to Israel from the Islamic world speaking start speaking with a more assertive voice after the war. Religious Jews start speaking with a more assertive voice after the war. So the old secular hegemony is kind of shattered. And along with it, the music is, is kind of shattered. And, and you don't hear much from the military entertainment troops after the Yom Kippur War. And, and a smart um, a colleague of mine, Yossi Klein Halevi, a journalist in Israel, told me, and I quoted in the book, that the Yom Kippur War killed the accordion. One of the fatalities of the Yom Kippur War was the accordion. And after the war, we're going to get a very different kind of music. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be much more singer-songwriters, people thinking about their own lives and their own souls, people speaking very much in the first person singular um, and not in the collective we. And, and that's very Leonard Cohen. So um, Israeli music post-73 is going to sound a lot more like Leonard Cohen than it did before the war. So finally, Mati, I want to end with a quote of yours and let you to maybe expand on it. I wanted to use the war to see Leonard Cohen, the singer, in a different light and use the singer to see the war in a different light. It became clear to me early on that the story of Leonard Cohen's concert tour was not enough, that I couldn't just tell a story about this artist uh, playing for faceless audiences, which is what you'd usually do if it was a tour documentary or a book about a rock star. The audience doesn't really matter in a, in a tour documentary. You'll just see the audience as kind of a blurred sea of faces or a roar of applause. And they're there as kind of a backdrop against which the performer does his or her thing. But that couldn't be the case with this story because what made the concert so amazing was the soldiers, mm. the fact that, that they were there at the darkest moment of their lives. And I needed to figure out what happened to them five minutes before the show, what happened to them 10 minutes after the show, who were these people and what was their interaction with Leonard Cohen? Why was it such a powerful interaction? And that involved tracking down the soldiers who, who'd seen him and trying to figure out who they were. So the book ended up being a, a new kind of portrait of Leonard Cohen, who's been ripped from his usual context and thrown into some very different context. I think that's really extreme. So he's not in the village and it's not his usual bohemian haunts. He's in the middle of a war. And that allows us to see him in a new way. And I think understand something very deep about who he, who he was 
even though it's not the book is not a biography, it's just a snapshot of one month basically in in his life, October 1973. And at the same time, Leonard Cohen allows us to get a new picture of the Yom Kippur War because we're tracking the war through his concerts. We're not tracking the great battles of the war. We're not um, interviewing the great generals of the war about the weighty decisions you know made about which division would would go where. We're moving on the periphery of the action. And we're just meeting people who happen to see Leonard Cohen in the desert. And I've learned as a journalist over many years that the periphery of the action is always where you're going to find the best stories. And I found that to be true in many contexts as a journalist. And I think it's definitely true this time as well. Thank you, Mati Friedman. The book is Who By Fire? Leonard Cohen in the Sinai. I recommend it for anyone you care about. Thank you for joining us on In the Spotlight. Once again, I'm Abby Pogrubin. So glad you could join us. Come over. To the window, my little darling I'd like to try to read your palm